Hello, everyone. Today we are going to talk about um, data locality in Kubernetes. So um, uh, we, we will discuss some research results and open source solutions to take advantage of data locality for uh, workflows and data intensive pipelines on Kubernetes. I'm Chen Wang from IBM Research. Um, I have been act actively contributing to several Kubernetes projects, including Kubernetes vertical pod auto scaling, Kubernetes scheduler plugins, and other projects. Recently, I'm more interested in sustainable computing project, and I have been actively contributing to Kepler and Clever under sustainable computing IOL org. Besides, uh, my research interests lie uh, mainly lie in resource management and methodologies. And we usually use including reinforcement learning, AI, time series predictions, and various data-driven approaches for um, container cloud resource management. And my co-speaker, co Shou Wei, is from Alexu. And please introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you, Chen. Uh, this is Shou Wei. I'm the co-maintainer of the Alexu project. And at the same time, I also take a responsibility for the open source product manager. Uh, my interest is mainly at the distributed uh, uh, file system and also with the co-design of the Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. So nowadays, more and more um, AI and machine learning workload migrate to Kubernetes. And Kubernetes has become a very natural fit for running those uh, AI and machine learning workload. There's a lot of reasons uh, to use Kubernetes for AI and data intensive workloads. For example, Kubernetes naturally provides the scalability to scale resources to meet the needs of AI and machine learning training workload. It can also provide the elasticity needed through auto scalers to scale production inference workload. Kubernetes also gives you the nice support of continuously develop development, which is required by nature for your AI and machine learning workload. Kubernetes can provide you a layer of abstraction that allows data scientists to access various services without worrying about the underlying infrastructure. It can provide you high availability and fail over protection to improve your service level agreement and resilience. It also allows you to operate your AI and machine learning workload across different clouds, including public clouds, private clouds, on-premise data centers, and even through secure air gap locations. And the cost of migration workload across boundaries becomes less costly. So it can also provide a single consistent platform for different stages of your AI and machine learning workflows and pipelines. Besides, uh, there's all types of various open source frameworks available in upstream community running on Kubernetes, including, for example, Argo, Kubeflow, Ray, TorchX, etc. So when you start running your AI and machine learning workflow, workflows and pipelines on the cluster, and you may want to answer the following questions for the data needed for your machine learning and AI workflows. So the first is, where are data stored permanently? And then you want to answer where are the data cached temporarily, whether it's in Kubernetes or not. And then you want to know if we know where the data is. So given the data locality information, how should we place our computing pods? And how do we distribute the load data to those pods fast and efficient enough? And how can we scale resources if the data volume changes significantly? And when we write the pipeline of AI machine learning uh, a job, what APIs should we use to get our data? And how can we guarantee the persistence and resilience of the data? And how can we forward data between containers in workflows and pipelines? And how can we manage the whole life cycle of data in Kubernetes? And if we are running a multi-tenant environment, 
uh, using my, uh, Kubernetes in a multi tenant way, how can we isolate and secure data access among different tenants? So I will first start with some research experiments we did, which try to answer the highlighted questions shown here. And then show we will introduce other questions uh, describe how uh, what are the existing open source tools we can use to solve those problems. So we start with trying a data intensive AI benchmark workload called Tesseract. And Tesseract is an open source optical character recognition engine. It operates on images, which is data intensive. It involves a lot of stages and tasks with non-trivial computational and data graphs. And between different stages and components, it features a smaller data transfers compared to more I.O. intensive workload. However, it also involves a significant amount of data at scale. We first convert this workflow from monolithic to microservices benchmark. So we can convert Tesseract from a monolithic application to two benchmarks based on its call graphs. The call screen benchmark precise pages of documents in five different microservices as shown in those granularity columns. Similarly, we partition the Tesseract into 11 microservice deployment, which serves as a fine-grained benchmark. For each microservice deployment, it can operate in different levels of parallel them, for example, per page, per block, or per text line. We started the precise time and how long each microservice takes in the whole pipeline. For example, the major component that takes a large processing time is LSTM. For the data side, fed into the pipeline, we use two single page documents to create a varying size of input from one to 128 pages to emulate different size of the input. So more details can be found in the reference the publication show below. So both benchmarks run as a pipeline of microservice jobs on Kubernetes clusters. So the Kubernetes cluster has three workers, each with eight cores and 32 gigabytes of memory and 50 gigabytes of disk. We set up an NSF server in the same data center in the same rack to emulate the performance of remote storage access. And that should be the ideal case because usually the cloud object storage server are much uh, further away. The memory and disk has featured a maximum of I.O. rate of 17 gigabytes per second and 175 megabytes per second, respectively. The networking connections between servers are through a 10 gigabytes per second network switch. We first did a very simple study on where we should cache the data. In the data pipeline benchmark, we basically have two types of containers. One run as data producer tasks who writes data, and the other runs as data consumer tasks who reads the data. And we assume between producer and consumer's data is accessed only sequentially. So intuitively, there are three ways to share the data between producers and consumers. These are sharing through persistent volume mounted on local memory, sharing through persistent volume mounted on local storage, and sharing through persistent volume mounted on remote storage. And from the results we show on the bottom left, we found out that um, the local memory and the local disk uh, solutions exhibit similar performance on the initial read and write operation. So the first in the ledger denotes the initial read and write operation, and the next denotes all the folder read and write operations. So re remote SN denotes data transfers between containers for those tasks that are co-located. We can see that local read and write have achieved a much higher bandwidth than the remote read and write. And sub subsequent local read and write bandwidth are up to like 4.4 times and 2.1 times at least compared to the remote read and write. So we can see local can see local data can significantly improve the 
uh, achievable bandwidth uh, than the remote written one. So similarly, we compare the local disk memory solutions with an anonymous cloud object storage. So the effective bandwidth we achieved is over six times higher than real object storage. And I, we believe it will not very allowed across different cloud providers. So from this study, we can see caching data locally will significantly improve the read and write bandwidth for your data. And eventually it will improve your computing resource utilization because you will load data faster. So then assuming you already have the data cached in your cluster, then how can you utilize the data locality information to determine your pod placement strategy? So we first separate the computing time from the I.O. time for those tasks and take a look at how I.O. time is impacted by your pod placement strategy. So we can see that the average I.O. time for local data is significantly lower than the average I.O. time for the data in remote storage. And the, 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 the time, the average I.O. time for the remote data is even five times, times more than the average I.O. time for the local data. We then compare the end-to-end -end processing time for the whole pipeline with different part placement strategy. Here, the 50%, 100% denotes the number of concurrent task executions for specific parallelism. And the consolidated solutions try to place tasks at the pre-node level in a sequential fashion, trying to saturate the resources available on each node. And the data-centric placement strategy tries to place paths to reduce the inter-node data movement and considers the number and amount of data to be shared and exchanged between functions. So we try to evaluate the end-to-end -end time for both coarse grain and fine grain benchmarks. We observe a 4.3 times and 2.6 times improvement for consolidate and data-centric placement solutions correspondingly. Though for fine grain benchmark, it is smaller but data-centric solutions would still improve at least 1.5 times in terms of end-to-end -end performance. Besides, it also tells us that the right granularity of decomposing your pipeline is very important. You do not want to partition your application too thin, so you minimize the data transfers between stages. From this study, we can see how much performance improvement you can gain while a data locality aware placement strategy. The third question is, if there are data passing between different stages in your AI and the machine learning pipelines, how can you pass the data? Naturally, there are four ways. And we did an experiment for those four solutions that compare with the baseline approach of using um, the remote storage to share the data. Those four solutions are like reading and read, writing data through a remote storage like NFS, and reading and writing data through a, a local memory-based volume or local uh, disk-based volume. And then the, the fourth solution is we can read and write the data between pods through a direct pipe or socket. And we can see the improvement uh, of different solutions over the remote storage varies across data sizes. And the biggest improvement is for the direct communication between parts on the biggest data chunk, which is 16 uh, gigabytes. If we want to enable direct data forwarding, there's a trade-off between the resource utilization uh, for your byte buffer and the size of the data you're forwarding, which is also determined by the buffer size. So we discuss more details about the trade-off for choosing of the buffer size, and it is presented in the paper called Blocky. It has been published in middleware workshops, so you can check more details uh, from the paper if you if needed. So. Um, we later 
test the direct data forwarding with different data passing patterns, for example, one to one, one to n, n to one, and n to n. So the speed up of using direct data forwarding for sizing can go up to 60 times. And it can at least achieve two times improvement for the largest data chunk with the full end-to-end -end data transfer patterns. Of course, the data, direct data forwarding can significantly reduce the end-to-end -end execution time of a workflow. It can reduce up to 60 times. But the disadvantage is you may lose the persistence of those intermediate data if your computing part is down. However, for those parts that process a huge amount of data, but with very small processing time, this may not be a, a bad scenario as you can always quickly restart your part. So that's all the experiments I did to answer those questions about data locality. And I will then pass it to Shou Wei and he will talk more about open source solutions and tools for those questions we want to ask. Uh, thank you, Chen. Um, in the following session, we want to give some idea about how you can answer this question and implement the real system uh, with the Alashu. And first of all, let me give some basic introduction about what is Alashu and what is Alashu for. And Alashu is an open source project start from the UC Berkeley MLAB in 2014. Uh, till now, we have more than 1,200 contributors, and we're also recognized by the many different uh, rankings. Uh, which is the most uh, critical Java-based uh, open source project uh, among the GitHub and world. <clears throat> so what is Alasho? Alasho is uh, a new layer uh, between the computer and uh, the storage uh, because you know like it's very hard to adopt the compute uh, with the uh, storage since there's uh, a lot of revolution for the computer side and also for the storage side. So every time for you want to do the data migration, or uh, you want to access the data from the uh, heterogeneous architecture, uh, it will meet a lot of like uh, uh, migration problem and also mainly like performance and uh, fitting and all this kind of issue. So actually we have built this new layer uh, in the middle of them to simplify the, uh, this kind of thing. And in this talk, I will mainly focus on the data accessibility, which is provided by uh, the Alasho catch functionality. Uh, we have a lot of questions to say, like uh, how we can really support a very efficient machine learning workflow and data pipeline in a Kubernetes. So uh, I will give the detailed answer how we can uh, build this data pipeline with Alasho with the following questions. <clears throat> Before we dive into the uh, solution, I want to give some idea uh, what is the challenge for building the machine learning data processing uh, from the data perspective. Uh, first of all, uh, actually you when you do the machine learning training and machine learning uh, data processing, you will fetch the data from the storage. Uh, from this part, uh, we call it, can call it like fetch store. Uh, if you meet uh, IO bound uh, problems there. Uh, for this part of the mini challenge is like, uh, if you have an efficient way to fetch the data from storage, for example, you fetch from the hard disk drive, maybe the speed is not enough for you to meet the pre-processing in the next step called the prepare store uh, for the uh, hardware accelerator, most likely like CPU or FPGA, this kind of uh, hardware. <clears throat> and for the next part, uh, uh, you want to fit the data into the GPU. So uh, they also have, can have the GPU bound uh, problem there. In this talk, we will mainly focus on how you can efficiently like uh, fetch the data from the storage, no matter it's cloud storage, on-premise storage, or local storage uh, to overcome the fetch store for the machine learning training. <clears throat> Just imagine like where you store the data nowadays because there are a tremendous of the data generated every day. So the most likely uh, the data you want to use for the machine learning training, actually it's not uh, only for the machine learning training, which means it also can do the data analytic, it can do the ETL job, and also it's also for maybe many, many different uh, customized compute uh, if, before you do the machine learning training. So it's likely like you will choose the 
most uh, cheapest, like most affordable storage there. It can be an object store, it can be a, a HDFS, or it can be a cloud storage there. And uh, <clears throat> but when you want to calculate this kind of data, so where's your uh, computer storage? Actually, computer storage nowadays, what we saw is like people mainly doing the training cluster with the Kubernetes because it's uh, give you many good like uh, like multi-tenancy management, it give you better deployment and as actually it will give much better ROI for your compute to run on this kind of environment. So the gap we see is like, because we have to fetch the data from the object store or Hadoop uh, HDFS kind of cluster to the training cluster, actually we have to fetch remote data. But just imagine like your data is really like small files uh, with the image, maybe just like 10K or even hundreds of uh, bytes. So actually it's uh, very efficient for you to fetch the data from this kind of uh, uh, storage system. So, so we just come up with an idea. If we have to do so, uh, it's not affordable because it will just uh, make the fetch store very heavy uh, in the machine learning uh, training process, which will make the GPU utilization or CPU utilization is very inefficient. It can be like maybe 10% 10, 10 of 20% of the CPU or GPU utilization in this kind of scenario. So we see like, uh, let's add one uh, layer there. So we want to see like, once you access this file, I want to uh, catch this file uh, in the training cluster, which means every time when you fetch the data, it will fetch the data from local instead of remove data. Uh, instead of like uh, uh, slow uh, permanent uh, uh, persistent layer. So the first question you want to answer is like, because actually this uh, uh, object storage or HDFS as actually provide very uh, standard way for you to access data. It can be the uh, HDFS uh, compatible interface. It can be uh, S3, S3A, uh, compatible interface. So actually, but what we saw from the machine learning training side is uh, people don't really uh, implement all this kind of interface to fetch from the no mapper, it's a uh, uh, TensorFlow PyTorch, or it's uh, in a not so efficient way. So, or it is not a very uh, cover every of the corner case for the machine learning training. So actually we do a lot of uh, investigation there, we find like uh, most, of, most of the time, like people still want to use the POSIX interface. It's like a local file system to access this kind of data. So they don't need to change anything from the application layer. The second question is, as I mentioned before, because the, this all this kind of issue from the remote data, uh, uh, remote data uh, is not so efficient. So how can we, uh, give the data locality in this kind of new architecture. The first of all, uh, if your storage is like uh, cloud storage, which is uh, can be multi-region uh, across the organization, or even like that in the same region, actually because the, they are, have throttle there, so it actually it's not so efficient if you want to run uh, many different uh, uh, training job at the same time. So the first uh, part, actually, we have the Alasho uh, cluster there, which included Alasho master and Alasho worker. Alasho master uh, meaning uh, uh, response for the metadata operation, uh, request response, and Alasho worker meaning for the data request and the data store uh, in the Alasho cluster. In this part, every time uh, you access data, actually, we will catch the data in the Alasho worker and catch the metadata in the Alasho master. Uh, and uh, this part actually will give you better performance uh, with the cluster level locality, uh, which means like when you access remote data or cross region data, actually it will keep the data in the same region for you to access. And afterward, we find it's not sufficient because uh, in the Kubernetes environment, uh, most of the time you have to launch a large uh, pod uh, there and uh, you have to mount the uh, uh, POSIX interface from the machine learning training, uh, training pod and uh, with the Alasio uh, fuse pod, which means like uh, if you want to fetch the data from the Alasio master and worker, actually it's still the remote call, which will 
in a large actually we use the gRPC as the transportation layers, which means they still have an overhead there. Uh, in this architecture, in order to provide the better performance, we also provide another uh, locality layer called the node level locality in the uh, Alachio fuse pod, which means the Alachio fuse will also capture the metadata for the file uh, same, at the same time with the data uh, in the same host machine with the machine learning training pod, which mean, which may help you to access data faster. The actually we saw like uh, all the how we improvement the performance here, but as we, we mentioned in the previous slides, because the persist layer still is the uh, the object storage or HDFS this kind of system. So how we guarantee the persistent is resilient of data. Actually, Alasio here is just a caching system, which means uh, we will not deal with the uh, data loss or this kind of thing. But uh, in this case, every time if you find the data is uh, uh, inconsistent from the Alasio namespace and the cloud storage namespace. Actually, we will fetch, fetch the data uh, back to the Alasio namespace to update the data. And for the write, we will just persist the data into the object store and HDFS to make sure data will not never lost. So as we can see from the previous uh, uh, slides, uh, actually we still like say uh, we have to uh, for the first, you just can imagine because it's a caching system. So which means you still very slow with the, the first time data load. So how can we overcome this kind of problem? So we want to say like, uh, even for the first time, I still don't want to uh, give a lot of uh, slow access for the machine learning training part, which means like slow means like with the money there. So we want to say like, we can prefetch the data uh, into the Alasio uh, namespace. So actually we provide one functionality called distribute load in our Alasio. But first of all, uh, from the client side, you can issue a distribute load command to Alasio uh, master pod. And uh, in most of the cases, because uh, you know which uh, model you want to train in, and uh, this training data actually is there. So you just uh, load a certain path into the Alasio namespace. So the training data will first of all, uh, it will load into the Alasio uh, worker and all this data will resilient into uh, the Alasio namespace. And actually it will overcome the first uh, thing as we called before, it will provide a cluster level a locality uh, in order to avoid the copy the data from the remote cluster uh, to the local cluster. And the second time, like when you uh, machine learning training pod want to really access this kind of data, Alasio fuse pod uh, will passive cache the data from the Alasio a worker pod to the Alasio fuse, fuse pod, which means like uh, at this time we will cache the file metadata and the data into the Alasio fuse pod. And uh, for the next part, like when you finish the data uh, uh, fetching and uh, you want to do the machine learning training uh, for the prefetching, actually it's already in the CPU memory. So actually this training data will uh, through the process volume uh, feed to the machine learning training pod in their memory to do the pre-processing. So actually we have a, a good understanding. So what is going on? How Alasio can help you to build this kind of system to solve all this kind of problem? And the next question is like, how do we manage the life cycle of the data in the Kubernetes? Uh, first of all, at the beginning, actually, we think about uh, many different ways. For example, at uh, uh, early stage, we use the mode called the sidecar to do all this kind of thing. And uh, afterward, we use the uh, Alasio CSI uh, driver to do all this kind of thing. CSI is the container uh, uh, storage interface uh, in the Kubernetes. And uh, the, at the beginning, we say like, uh, for example, you have a PyTorch or you can call it a business pod uh, in your environment. Actually, every, every time when you crash your node server or it uh, has some problem uh, for the Alasio fields, which means you have to restart uh, all this kind of uh, uh, pod to make sure you can uh, recover from this kind of uh, uh, disaster. So afterward, we say that it's better to separate, uh, also do the better management uh, with the application and the Alasio fuse pod, which may make it more reliable uh, for running the service in, in the environment. 
So actually, we introduced the uh, CIS component into the Alash uh, Kubernetes story. And uh, when you want to do it, you just the CIS component will create the Alash fuse port, and it will also mount the persistent volume into the Alash fuse port, and at the same time, uh, it will mount into the application container. So, which means like every time it have some disaster, you can just restart the application port and the Alash fuse port separately. And if you want to upgrade all this kind of thing, you don't need to kill the whole business port together with Alash uh, fuse port to do this kind of thing. You can just uh, keep them uh, upgraded independently. So afterward, I want to share some uh, real use cases of what we saw in the Microsoft. Uh, this is not a best uh, use, use case to sh show the performance, but uh, actually uh, we really appreciate it because actually this shows the beginning uh, of the uh, GPU utilization, utilization of the uh, machine learning training and the end of the GPU utilization at the machine learning training. So we can see what is happened here. So overall, actually, I like to speed up end-to-end -end training time by uh, 18%. Actually, as you can see, when it's reached about 11 uh, a.m., actually, it's already, I mean, it's, it's already not an I.O. bound application. So which means all this data already fit into the CPU memory and also fit into the GPU memory. So maximum GPU utilization for this model training uh, with uh, their existing workflow is about 75%, which means uh, Actually, even you like reduce the I/O uh, bound to the zero, actually the performance of uh, the utilization of the GPU still will be there. And for the Alasho, uh, you can see actually you can see the below figure. It shows that at the beginning, it actually it will not have so many uh, to prefetch the data or warm your data from the uh, on the storage, which means like you can directly access data and bump the CPU utilization from the zero to 70%, 75% in very short time. So which means actually it will save a lot of uh, money for you to warm the data and also write the data back. And the, another part is like, because uh, previously people still have to uh, replicate the data from the, uh, for example, from the object store uh, to the, uh, to the like, uh, the local storage system. This can be a, a HDFS cluster or like a POSIX a compatible distributed file system or network file system there. So you still have to do a lot of error prone and you have to do the data copy by yourself. But after you set up the Alash there, you don't need to worry about it. Okay, really appreciate uh, everyone attending here and uh, and uh, if you want to uh, uh, contact with us, feel free to join our uh, Slack channel and also join our um, GitHub on the Alash Network. Thank you.